Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this week's Everton show. No Premier League action for us to look forward to this weekend of course. All royal blue eyes will doubtless be on our Irish boys as they bid for Euro 16 qualification. But we've still got lots to discuss this week including this little lot. Well no, I think my affinity is with our players and, and clearly if we could get uh, a very good experience out of it I think it would be very beneficial. When you play uh, with good players uh play so easy and yes it's a good assist and I won't assist more goal, more times for uh... yeah. to have a young man like that, you know, who's not well himself and, you know, his concern is for the other children. It really is inspiring. Well, last weekend, of course, brought our last ever visit to Upton Park, unless we draw West Ham away in the FA Cup later in the season. And the game ended all square, which, Graeme Stewart, alongside me, was probably just about the right outcome. Yeah, I'll make you about right, Darren. Yeah, I'm not so sure that any either side did enough to win the game to pick up all the three points, but, you know, we kept the momentum going after a good victory against Sunderland at home the week before so you know we're accumulating the points and West Ham you know they've had a really good start to the season haven't they? You've got some quality players and I thought defensively we were very solid. Ian Snowden in the commentary made John Stones his man of the match would you go along with that? Yeah I would do I thought John was absolutely outstanding I mean he just gets he's like a Rolls Royce I keep saying it every week he's just getting better all the time um, I think the hardest thing for John is to keep his concentration levels you know he reminds me a little bit of Rio Ferdinand when he came onto the scene you know, the only person who could make a mistake was Rio himself, and then John reminds me very much of that. He makes it look so easy, doesn't he? Well, he does, and I mean, that's the beauty of, of, of John as a player. He does make everything look very, very easy. You just don't want him to make that one little slip up, because at centre-half, that can be, have huge uh, consequences for you. Rolls-Royce is the perfect description, isn't it? Well, that 1-1 draw in East London preserved Roberto's unbeaten record against the Hammers as Everton manager, not including a penalty shootout defeat, of course. And the Blues boss felt that a share of the spoils was the very least that his players deserved at Upton Park. From our point of view, obviously when you go 1-0 down, you feel that the, the home side are going to have the, the opportunity to, to manage the game. Um, I thought the way we came back into the game and the second half, we were so comfortable defensively. I thought that was the big, big uh, uh, difference in the way that we, we nullified all the threat from West Ham. And that second half, we, where we have the quality is that that final pass, that, that way of breaking teams down and it was coming. So the feeling at the end is a little bit of a, a bit of a disappointment in terms of we couldn't get that bit of magic in front of goal that we had in the first half with the outstanding ball from Gerard De La and finish from Romain Lukaku, the quality that we had on the pitch. I thought the, the, the defensive attitude was sensational. Remember that we come at the back of, of being a little bit stretched. Um, playing at home against a team like, like Sunderland and today it was important to be able to keep that solid outlook with the same personnel and I thought the attitude was terrific in that respect, to have that uh, concentration, that focus, to be able to, 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 to help each other in order to get that, that solid outlook as a team. And then uh, you're coming at Upton Park and uh, West Ham team that started the season extremely well. Uh, we end up with more corners than the home team, which it represents a little bit. It shows you the threat that we, we were getting. So we're happy with the performance, but probably disappointed that we couldn't get a little bit of magic with the amount of attacking quality that we had on the pitch. Amongst the press lads at half-time, unusually, when they were talking about the goal, everybody was raving about the assist rather than the finish. It was a peach of a through ball, wasn't it? Both actions are special. I think something that we're getting used to from both players. Gerard de Lofeo has got that sensational vision that is very rare to see in a winger and normally they get down and, and they want to run with the ball uh, to have the option of a 1v1 situation and then to be able to to assist in the manner that he did was was fantastic the weight of pass then when you see Rom running to space with that quality we used to see him uh, doing that and I thought the goal was full of quality and, 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 and a terrific terrific action it's just I felt that we could we felt that we could get a couple of more open, uh, clear, good opportunities just to, to get probably uh, an extra two points in that performance. Graeme, since that game, social media in particular has been a little bit harsh on Everton. We've attracted a bit of criticism, particularly James McCarthy for the tackle on, on Payette, but that happens, doesn't it, in football? It does. I mean, it seems more and more with every passing week, 
you're not allowed to tackle anybody, are you? I'm certainly, you know, we know Jamesy and there's no way on the planet that Jamesy would try and inflict an injury upon a fellow professional. Um, you know, I think they were talking about more of like a scissor kind of action. Um, and I don't think it was there was any intent in there from James whatsoever. Um, I certainly wouldn't have us down as a dirty side, that's for <laughs> certain. I mean, Jamesy got a yellow card and quite rightly so, but from what I can recall, that was the only poor challenge in the game. Yeah, oh, I think they've just got a bit of a bee in their bonnet about about that situation. I mean, Pae is a is a terrific player. I mean, he's you know it, 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 his capable his capability all round is is phenomenal. His 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 skills, you know, his his passing is excellent as well. So, all in all. I think they were more than disappointed that he disappeared off the pitch. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, since Roberto Martinez became the Everton boss, we've played West Ham United seven times now and we've scored 12 goals. Romelu Lukaku has contributed seven of those 12 by himself, finding the net in every game. And it's an incredible record and one that Big Rom is justifiably proud of. Well, I think it was a game where yeah, both of the teams could win. Um, both of us, we had uh, a lot of chances in the one. I think uh, if there was a second goal, the one who f scored the second goal first would, would have won the game. So, you, sorry, you scored yet again against West Ham. Were you always confident once you were fed through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, that's my game. Um, going in behind and try to be clinical in the 1v1. And as soon as the ball went on, you had to score the goal and uh, so we could uh, get us back into the game. And, uh, you know, it was a great pass from Jerry and uh, the finish was good and um, I was happy. But. Uh, you know, I play football to win games and uh, I think uh, we are all disappointed not to have won today. You had a late chance, didn't you, at the near post? Did you sense that that might be going in? Yeah, you know, as a striker you need to try to get across your man and, you know, Brendan delivered a good ball in and I came across him and I thought, like, that the ball would go in, but, you know, unlucky, maybe next time. But overall, not too disappointed. It's a, a difficult place to come to, isn't it? Of course, of course. This year they play brilliant football. They have won against all the top teams at the moment. So, uh, you know, it was a, a very good game for us. But, you know, you play football to win. I think in the dressing room we will be disappointed because the last pass could have been better today. But uh, there's something, the that, that great positive signs about the game today. Well, Romelu Lukaku's seventh goal against West Ham was teed up beautifully for him, wasn't it, by Gerard De La Feo. The young Spaniard had a gap the width of a football to steer his pass into and he delivered it just perfectly. And if big Romelu loves scoring goals, Gerard himself just loves to set them up. I think the first half, um, West Ham played so good and Everton... Um, the last 20 minutes play so good because when I lose, you go to... I need goes to... For, for a score, but but it's a good point because it's a difficult team and, and play so good. Uh, Payet, uh, Lanzini, it's a good players and it's good it's good point for, for, for play away. One minute to go at the end of the first half, we're losing 1-0, then you pick out Romelu Lukaku with a lovely pass. Yes, I I tell uh, every week I'm I'm so happy for, for play again, uh, with Rome, with Ross, it's good players and when you play uh, with good players, uh, play so easy. And yes, it's a good assist and I won't assist more, goal, more <laughs> times for Rom. Big Rom finished it nicely, didn't he? Yes, uh, it's, it's an it's a animal. In the Spain, it's an animal. It's, <laughs> inside the box, it's, it's terrible and I won the uh, Rome score a lot of goals this season. West Ham defended quite deeply. It was difficult for you to find space, wasn't it? Yes, uh, defence good, but I think Everton needs um, more the position. If I if I if I take the position and play good, I think uh, make uh, more uh, more chances. But it's difficult to play against West Ham. West Ham win the, uh, all of all of big big teams uh, this season, and it's difficult. So, what's the plan for you for the next few days now, Jerry? Are you away on international duty again? Yes, now I'm tomorrow I, I go to Madrid for for under twenty ones and I I have two games, one in Spain in Almeria and after in, in Croatia. Now it's time to national. I'm so happy for for goes to, to my national team. Jerry wants more of the ball and you can understand that, Graham, can't you? Yeah, I'd like to see him get more of the ball as well. I mean, I think, you know, he, he's such a vital cog in our side at this moment in time. Clearly he's he's high on confidence. There's times he's not going to beat the full back and there's times he's going to misplace passes, but he carries a huge threat 
and that's vitally important. So we've got to get that ball out to him at every given opportunity. Let him take the fall back on, let him get his head up, try and pick Romelu out or whoever that may be in the box as well. Midfield runners, he's got that capability, we've got to use it. A lovely finish by Romelu Lukaku again, but as soon as the ball went into the back of the net, loads of people in the press box shouted, what a pass, what yeah. a through ball. It was a terrific pass. I mean, the goal all round, as you heard Roberto say in his piece before, you know, it was a terrific goal in, from every aspect. The, the vision of, of Jerry, the run of Romelu, and the finish was sublime. Lukaku was on fire, isn't he? He is. He's, he's doing very well, Rom. Um, what did he get, 20 goals last season? You know, he's certainly well on the way to that. He's nearing mm. double figures already, mm. you know, come, come the back end of November. So, you know, it'll be, it's terrific. I'm sure Romelu has set his sights on beating 20 from his first season. We get 30 or 40, we could play West Ham every week with Big Rom up front. He loves playing against them, doesn't he? And that brings part one of this week's Everton show to a close. But don't go too far away from the telly because after the break we'll bring you some Finch Farm footage of the lads doing a golf challenge and we'll have a feature that's most definitely one for the ladies. Welcome back to part two of this week's Everton show. Right, we're shifting from football to golf for our next piece of film. Southport-born Tommy Fleetwood is making a real name for himself in the world of professional golf. He's had four professional wins so far, including one on the European Tour. And being a good Evertonian, he was keen to issue a challenge to some members of the Everton first-team squad. Hi, I'm Tommy Fleetwood, professional golfer, mad Evertonian. Came down to Finch Farm today for the Coral Golf Chip Challenge. We're going to chip a ball into a bucket. We're going to see how many times it takes us to get it. I'm going to give it a go and then we'll see if the players can beat me. I did it in three attempts. Let's see if the players can beat me. <laughs> Head was up early. Love how quiet it goes. Hey, you Quiet for the first one. Well reached, John. Does a bouncing count? That's what we were discussing. That bouncing's count, did it? And pins. And pins. Yeah. <laughs> bunker shots count, didn't they? Here we go. Oh! oh. <laughs> It's a six, 60. It's very strange seeing the players try something different down at Finch Farm. One or two of the guys look nervous. And by the way, 
Plenty of the players have done this challenge with Tommy Fleetwood, so keep an eye on the Everton YouTube channel to see how the rest of the lads got on. They looked a bit nervous to me. How can they be nervous? Because Tommy Fleetwood's a, a terrific player because you're out of your comfort zone. You know, you can play in front of thousands and thousands of people playing football, but you're in your comfort zone. As soon as you get a golf club in your hand, you are shaking like a leaf. Because I was when, we, when I did it with Snods, the golf challenge meet I did with uh, Snods. But talking about Stonesy, he's what about a Rolls Royce of a player? He's not a Rolls Royce <laughs> golfer, though, is he? He was getting frustrated then, Stonesy, wasn't he? Yeah, we was. had the bleep machine for the first time on the Everton show, and just as well. Yeah, just as well. But no, uh, fairness to uh, AD as well. AD mm. done well. Five, five mm. little chips, because it is tough chipping. It's probably the hardest uh, discipline of golf, I would say. How's your golf diamond? Um, I've gone into retirement for the winter, Daz. <laughs> golf clubs have been tucked away. I don't play in this weather. <laughs> you did well in the summer, though, didn't you? I did all right. I did OK. I'm playing OK, but I don't, just don't play enough. You're working me too hard, Daz. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the day. Right, I promised you something for the ladies, didn't I? Well, here we go. A few years ago, Everton in the community raised a huge sum of cash by selling charity calendars that featured first-team players in various but totally tasteful states of undress. This year we thought it was time to do it all again, so we rounded up 12 keen volunteers, we turned one of the academy dressing rooms into a photo studio and snapped away, and all for a good cause. Not sure where to start with this one. Time. Sorry, the game's gone. <laughs> you were sitting there shaking your head. What month are you and Snods? <laughs> Can you imagine? There's not enough room on the calendar for me and Snods. <laughs> Snods would be April and May, wouldn't he? Um, <laughs> let's talk about fitness levels. The lads are clearly in fantastic nick, aren't they? They wouldn't put themselves up for that sort of calendar. And uh, it has changed, hasn't it? The approach to fitness and diet and sports science. Yeah, I mean, you know, the amount of sports science involved in the game now is, is incredible, really. So, I mean, and every, every individual player will have their own individual requirements and, and, and um, progress to, to follow and what have you. Uh, done by the physios and what have you. So clearly they're in decent shape, <laughs> been working hard on their abdominal exercises and what have you. So no, it's, it's a different game and the fitness levels have got to be super high now. It's all for a good cause and I'm sure, as it did a few years ago, that calendar will raise an awful lot of money. You can pre-order the calendar, by the way, right now at evertondirect.com and all proceeds do, of course, go to Everton in the community. Well, from charity calendars at Finch Farm to the recent FIFA Under-17s World Cup tournament in Chile, worlds apart, but both obviously with an Everton connection. Academy prospect Tom Davis joined up with the international squad for that World Cup tournament and before the young players jetted off to South America, he had a surprise visit from Roy Hodgson, who invited him to train with the seniors, the Roonies, the Canes and the Barclays. Young Tom tells us more about both experiences. Um, yeah, it was a great experience for me. Uh, to go out, to go out with Dean on side and captain on side was something I'm really proud of and I, I really enjoyed doing. It was a shame about the results, but I gained a lot from it. And obviously, three games against three totally different teams. One from Africa, one from Asia, one from South America. How difficult and how different was that for you? Yeah, well, each game was completely different. Um, we've had to prepare, prepare for each game and work out how the other team's going to play, and that was different for each game, but. We had, we had good preparation and, and we'd done alright in the games, but we just we just couldn't find the uh, the goals to go with our performance. So It's obviously tournament football. How different is that to your, to your normal league campaign? Yeah, it is totally different. Like um, you, you might only get one chance in the game, but then you've got to take it. And if you don't, you're out, as we found out quite early in the tournament. But we've we done alright on the whole, but we just couldn't couldn't score the goals. So that's something we, we really like need to improve on. Obviously, you're coached by Neil Jusnip as well. You must know him from his time at Everton. How nice was that to have him there? Yeah, it was, it was really good to be back working with him. He was really pleased to work with me and James again. He, he, he obviously misses the club, and it was good to have a few lads around him that he knew and worked with. You touched on James Yates there as well. You were out there with him. How much did he help you? How yeah, much did yeah. you help him? Well, it's always nice to have your teammates around you when you go to them places that you, you 
with new lads and you're not really sure about who you get along with, but you've always I've always got James there with me to to help me out, but then you obviously mingle with the other lads and get to know them. And we can't let you leave without talking about your experience with the first team as well. Talk us through that. How did that come about? Yeah, yeah, well, it's a bit of a strange one, really. I just went down for breakfast and I've been told I'm training with the senior team, so it was a, it was a good, good news, but it was a real shock to me, so I wasn't sure how to take it. And then got down, just introduced me to the lads, and then from there went on. Uh, Neil introduced me to Ross Barkley, obviously, and he looked after me throughout the session, so it was, it was a really good experience. Like, I believe you scored a couple as well. Must be nice. Yeah, yeah. We done a done a little three v two, and I, I did score a few, so it was really good on Hall. Yeah. That's Tom Davis there, and another of our young players has had a loan deal arranged for him this week. David Hennen has made a month-long switch to League One outfit Fleetwood Town. The young Belgian striker is very much looking forward to the challenge. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy because uh, I, I start maybe my, my first uh, apparition in professional team. And I think it's the, the, the great opportunity for me. And it's an opportunity for you to play games at a competitive level, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Because I play with the man and uh, it's different to play with the 21. So I'm, I'm happy to, to sign to, to, to Fleetwood. What are you hoping to gain from this loan deal? What do you think you'll gain as a footballer? Um, it's better for me because uh, I think... Uh, you have the, it's the competition, uh, prof professional competition, so I think it's, uh, it's just give me well for, 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 for the future. And this season you've been playing for Everton's reserves and then the 21 sides, how has that been going? Very good, very good. Uh, we have the, the very good team, uh, I score and I give the assist. Uh, last season uh, I, uh, I score a lot as well, uh, we, we, we have the, the, the good season in uh, last season. So I'm very happy and now I just want to, to, to keep going for, for the future. Graham, David Hennen, young Belgian youth international. It'll be something of a culture shock going to Fleetwood, but it's bound to do in the world of good. I think it will do in the world of good. It's good to just get out and, and play competitive football, especially in the lower, lower leagues as well. You know, there's no hot, you know, no bars hold there. Mm. You know, they'll be they'll be tough. They'll be mm. tackling him. They'll be roughing him up. And I think it will develop him. I'm sure it will. I mean, he, I've seen him play a few times now, David, and he's got good skills about him, good movement. Um, but he's quite a lightweight lad, so you know, it might just toughen him up a little bit and make him realise that you know, English football is <laughs> a little bit different to, to to Belgian international football. It'll certainly be breezy for him, yeah. up there on the coast. Good luck to him. Well, we've reached the halfway point of this week's show. Coming up after this short break, it's our big interview slot. And this week, it's our former Swedish World Cup winger, Nicholas Alexanderson. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to part three of this week's Everton show. It's the big interview section now, and this week we speak to one of only six Everton players to have ever scored a goal in a World Cup Finals tournament. Nicholas Alexanderson did it for Sweden against England in 2002, and he's been speaking about his career to the Everton show. Yeah, I'm uh, very well, thank you. It's always nice to be back here again. Um, yeah, since I moved back in uh, 2004, I, uh, I played another... I thought when I moved back home that I was going to finish off with uh, maybe another two years of playing uh, for Gothenburg, but it ended up being five years and another 41 caps for the national team and two championships. So it worked out uh, better than I hoped for, really. And uh, after I retired uh, 2008, I've worked uh, coaching youngsters at the school connected to IFK Gothenburg and uh, really enjoying it. Is it nice to be able to give something back to the game and bring on the, the future generations of Swedish football? Yeah, I mean, um, I've had so much fun with the football throughout my whole life, really. Uh, that when I started as a kid playing football, it was yeah, the most fun uh, to do. And uh, I'm still lucky to be able to work with, with football. Let's just look back to your days at Everton, when you look back at, at that time, what are your best memories? Um, well, it, it was a bit... It, it started off well for me when I first came. Uh, I had a good start uh, to the club. I remember coming in the pre-season when I first came, uh, scoring, I think, five goals in five halves. Uh, but then uh, I was 
held back a bit by injuries during my time. So the first two seasons I, I came on, played, and then had a, an injury and got back. So, uh, but the first two three seasons worked well. Then I was really disappointed, especially at myself for the last uh, year, year and a half, where I didn't perform as near as well as I know I could have done. Uh, I think uh, after the World Cup 2002, when I came back, uh, I was a bit mentally tired, and that slowly started when I was became yeah, didn't the regular started and uh, on the side uh, I lost a bit of my confidence, and then I should have been been stronger to 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 get back there, but. Uh, Luckily enough, uh, when I look back at it, it was an, uh, yeah, a learning time for me. Uh, it helped me a lot afterwards uh, to appreciate wh when, when you, you're playing well. I think w it was my first big setback, the first time I, I ended up outside a, a starting 11. So, um, yeah, a bit dis looking back, a bit disappointed at myself uh, that I didn't do better for my last uh, year and a half at the club, uh, I would really have uh, wanted to, to do better for them. As you say, though, you, you got off to a flying start. I think it was something like nine goals in, in your first pre-season. You couldn't yeah. really, coming from Sheffield Wednesday, you couldn't have hoped for a better start. No, it worked really well. I, I remember, the, I, I think we had a friendly against Man City at Goodison, the, the the game before my first uh, Premier League start for, for Everton and uh, got an ankle injury after I'd scored two. So uh, I remember travelling to Leeds for the first game and uh, I was in the stand with uh, like supporters that really wanted to play. So, But that was a bit the thing it went for me at the club. Uh, struggle a little bit with all kind of strange injuries that yeah, held me back from uh, reaching my best potential, I think. So a bit regretful for that and uh, that I, I couldn't keep my form going a little bit better. But uh, yeah, that's how it was at the time. Well, you were brought here by Walter Smith. Uh, yeah. What was it like working under, under Walter and Archie Knox as well? Um, well, I know since when I played for Gothenburg, in the, we played in the Champions League the year 96-97. We knocked out Glasgow Rangers in the, the qualification stage. Uh, and I know that uh, after that he, he knew who I was. So after my year at uh, Sheffield Wednesday, I, I know that the manager wanted me to come here. So I enjoyed playing. We, di we didn't have the best of seasons uh, those, year those years. It were quite a few new players and we didn't really settle as a team. So a bit up and down. One season we did okay and the other one we, we struggled a bit. So it was hard to, to get going as a team. But uh, I enjoyed playing under him. Archie, he could be uh, quite strict. Well, I, I think you can say it was sort of the the old school of the coaching. Uh, sometimes it, it helped off with, the, with someone telling you off a bit when you didn't do your job. Sometimes we wanted something different maybe, but in, in total I, I enjoyed playing for them. They must have been good times at Belfield as well because you had characters the likes of Gaza there at the time <laughs> as there, well. There were a few characters coming and going d during the, those years. Gaza, as you said, we had Dav David Ginola for a short spell, Graveson, the ma Mad Dane. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, there was quite a few characters uh, around, Abel Ch Xavier as well. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun time. What are your favourite stories from, from those times? Oh, uh, well, I can't, I can hardly remember them all, but I remember when Ginola made his first uh, training that Gessa came out with a wig in the, in, in the warm up, and yeah, there was all sorts of things going on. Uh, with Gessa around, you, you were never safe of uh, what could happen. How much did that help the atmosphere and the camaraderie in the team at that time? Yeah, I think it's important in all squads that you have a, a good atmosphere and a few laughs sometimes. Uh, that obviously helps. Uh, if it's too serious uh, the whole time, it, it, I mean, you need a bit of laughs as well to, to get that uh, squad feeling going. 
yeah, the likes of David Unsworth, Duncan Ferguson coaching here now. How important do you think it is for Everton to still have those ties with its former players? I think it's very good. Uh, I mean, you get a connection, you get someone who, who's been there and can tell them importance. I mean, uh, and you see players who, who stay longer at Everton. I mean, play like Leighton Baines. He, I guess he's had offers from many, but decided to, to stay at the club. I think it's important to have those uh, with a big heart for the club uh, and I think that's what you get I mean I was here for four years and I, I got still big feelings for the club and I uh, really hoping they're doing well so I think that's great when you can get that atmosphere and, and keep the players at the club longer. He was a decent player, Nicholas, wasn't he, Diamond? He was. Re reliable yeah. is the word that I'd probably use for Nicholas. You know, he was, you know, he pitched away with his with his goals, great work rate as well, good attitude, yeah, and you know, played played plenty of times for Sweden as well. So no, all in all, a really good all round player. He was a steady Eddie, wasn't he? And, and you need those in your squad, don't you? Well, if you're a manager and you know you're going to get a seven, eight out of ten every week out of a certain player then you're quite happy and I think every manager who's probably worked with Nicholas would say that, you know, yeah. that they were pretty confident that he'd give them everything that you've got every week. He's a great lad as well, always nice to see him back at yeah. uh, Finch Farm and Goodison. You mentioned Paul Gascoigne there, Diamond. Did you ever play against Gazza? You must have done, I suppose. I did do when I was, when I was a young lad at Chelsea we, you know, and Gazza was playing for Tottenham and I think if you ask most people, you know, Gazza's best years were probably when he was at Tottenham. Yeah. He was an unbelievable talent. It's such a shame he probably didn't fulfil the potential that we all thought he should have done, but certainly at Tottenham he was an unbelievable player. Is he one of those players or one of those people that you could say he was too good? Because he, he struggled to handle it all, didn't he? Yeah, I, he, he wasn't too good on, on the pitch. He was probably not great off the pitch. That was <laughs> probably his, that was his issue, but he was a, you know, he was a lovable rogue gazer, wasn't he? Yeah. You know, any, anybody who's been in his company, I've spoken to players who've been in his company and said he, like, what a terrific lad he was, but he was just a little bit loopy <laughs> in the <laughs> nicest possible way. But uh, what a talent. But you get that, don't you? You get that with, you mm -hmm. know, Mavericks, geniuses, whatever you want to call them. They're all a little bit crazy, aren't they? The most recent pictures of Gazza in the paper, he looks as if he's fighting back anyway. He, looks, he looked better, didn't he? Yeah, he does. He looks a lot better and everybody in football wants to see Gazza well and fit and, uh, you know, we all obviously send him our best. Well, talks of Alex Anderson and Paul Gascoigne leads us to international football. It's international break this weekend, but it's a massive weekend for the Irish. It is. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the games. I'm sure the lads are. It's a great opportunity for them. Difficult game in Bosnia, obviously, to start off with. But if I was the Irish, I'd be happy to be going over there first. Mm. You know, bring them back to Dublin and, you know, give them what four out in Dublin. And hopefully the, inc the important thing is to make sure they're still in that game uh, uh, and preferably ahead, if not on at least on an even kill going into the game Monday. It's a strange one, isn't it, two-legged football? Because you've got to manage the first game. If you're 1-0 down, you don't have to chase it, do you? No, you don't have to chase it. I mean, it can change very, very quickly. You just don't want to put yourself in a situation where the second leg becomes null and void. Mm. Because, you know, that, that's just a waste of your time. You've got to be, you've got to get your set up right. You've got to make sure that you attack. Don't, you know, don't just sit back because sometimes the, you feel like, you know, by defending and not pushing yourself forward, you end up in the back, on the back foot, on the edge of your own box and they're creating chances left, right and centre. So vitally important that they manage it, as you said, Dad. It'd be great for, for James McCarthy and Seamus and Gibbo and Aidan McGeady, wouldn't it, if yeah, they do what, come out on top? Yeah, that's what we want. I mean, the four of them, you know, would be really excited about the European Championships. It's good for their profiles, good for the profile of Everton Football Club as well. So we certainly wish those four all the best. England have got two decent games, haven't they? Yeah, terrific games, aren't they? It's a shame they're friendlies in some <laughs> respects because, you know, they would be mouthwad to win pro prospects. I'm sure Roy Hodgson's going to use it as a as a tool to, to, to blood some new talent. Um, you'd like to think that Ross and Stonesy are going to get some football underneath their belt as well over the two games. So, you know, it's a good test for us, actually. How good an experience will that be for the likes of Stonesy and Ross to play against your Frances and your Spains? Yeah, well, of course it will be because, you know, they've got top players. There's no doubt about that, especially the Spanish. You know, they're a really solid outfit. Uh, We've we known from, from past competitions that, you know, when it gets to you know, the European Championship finals and World Cup finals as well. The Spanish and the French are always there and they're about. So, you know, it'll be a good test for our boys. The gaffer will just be watching the television, won't he, thinking, just come back right. in one piece. We say it every time, don't we, that you disappear for these internationals and you're just crossing your fingers, toes, everything possible in the hope that they all come back fit because, you know, that's important for us because we're getting to a busy period now in the Premier League. Absolutely. Well, by the way, I said earlier, didn't I, that Nicholas Alexanderson was one of six players 
to score a goal in a World Cup Finals tournament while still an Everton player. I'll give you the other five at the end of the show. We'll take a quick break right now, though, but in part four we'll hear from Leighton Baines and Roberto Martinez. Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this week's Everton show. Well, earlier this week, Goodison Park staged its annual remembrance service. Staff and ambassadors joined supporters and Everton Heritage Society members at the Dixie Dean statue to remember all those who gave their lives so that we could live in freedom. It was a terrific service, again, at Goodison Park Diamond, but young Anita there, what a showstopper she was. She did very well, didn't she? Um, you know, lovely uh, lovely rendition of Amazing Grace, mm. and yeah, it was a lovely service. Harry Ross did us proud again, as he, as he normally does, and everybody, um, everybody attended it and gave it the full respect it deserved. As they did at Upton Park when they had the servicemen on the pitch, and at Goodison the week before, before we played Sunderland, we had the servicemen and women on the pitch. And it's emotional, isn't it, the terrific reception they get from supporters all over the country? Yeah, I mean, that's it, the outpouring from everybody, you know, around the country was, was terrific, the respect that they, they quite rightly are given, um, because we have got our freedom because of them. Just imagine going back to football in the 20s and before that, being a professional footballer and getting whisked away to do national service. I know, you can't believe it, can you? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it'd never happen now, would it? So, you know, we're, we're, we're very fortunate. And we're very proud of them as well. Well, since picking up a nasty pre-season injury, Leighton Baines has been keeping himself busy. Just recently, of course, he co-hosted this very programme with my good self. And earlier this week, he visited the brand new multi-million pound, very, very impressive Alderhey Children's Hospital. They invited Leighton to be a patron and Leighton was happy to accept. We do a lot of work, the club. Um, but for me, this is local, it's in my community. It's something I enjoy doing, you know, those you know, little small differences you can make, you know, while, while you're still playing and people and the kids are still interested, then it's important, you know, that you come down and do that. So, you know, it's great for me, you know, that I've been allowed to really and that I'm in a position where you can do something like that. Some of the kids are, you know, really sick at the end of the day and they're only here for long periods of time and it's difficult. You know, they've got a battle on their hands and, you know, as I say, every now and again, you know, they do want to see you and you can come down and sort of make a small difference to to their day and it, it's great to be able to do that. We're here day in day out um, serving and supporting the kids uh, and families and siblings of those in Alderhey uh, and each day we're in here with the workshops doing all types of fun activities and just trying to bring a bit little ray of sunshine to an otherwise what might be a dull day really so utilising the, uh, the medicine of laughter. He was diagnosed with Perth's disease in 2011 and an urgent referral had been made to Alder Hay themselves. In, in February 2012 he received his first operation and he's been backwards and forwards for more operations and treatments since. Well when it was last Christmas he had his last major operation and that was on the 18th of December and what we did was we collected as many toys as we possibly could from children aged 0 to 16 and we brought them in on his operation day and we donated them over to the charity office to be distributed throughout the full hospital on Christmas Eve so the children had something to wake up to on Christmas morning. I'm going to help like people for um, get some toys because they would be just like bored all Christmas when they're in the hospital. All these famous people, um, they're, they're donating toys and it's just fabulous. To have a young man like that, you know, who's not well himself and, you know, his concern is for the other children. It really is inspiring, you know, that, you know, at that young age, you know, he, he's taken that responsibility and, 
you know, despite his own situation, he's motivated to help other people. We've got a long-standing relationship with um, Everton Football Club and the players come in regularly and obviously Everton and the community are in every day. Um, for Alder Hay Charity, the opportunity um, for having patrons is to obviously raise the profile of the charity and the fact that we are still fundraising. We're in this fantastic facility, but the fundraising hasn't stopped. So latent support and getting the word out there be absolutely crucial for us. It deserves to be, you know, shouted about really and the people who work here, you know, everyone should know about the fantastic work they do. So, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, coming down as often as needed really, you know, whenever they feel like I can help. You know, I've come before and spent time just with individuals and, you know, just little things like that. You know, you you brighten up, you know, one person's day for a couple of hours, then you know, it's it's brilliant to be able to do that. So, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, working with with the hospital in the future. Graham, I've been fortunate enough to have a good look around the Alderhay facility, the revamped Alderhay. It's a fantastic place, isn't it? Yes, I'm led to believe that. I'm looking forward to going down there. I will obviously go down there about the middle of December. Mm -hmm. I would uh, imagine Darren will take some presents down for the kids. And it's a lovely day. Though, it is it? a lovely day, yeah. I mean, we all look forward to that. I know the lads do as well. So, you know, we'll... we'll Good to see some of those kids down there and get a smile on their faces and, and you know, Leighton's an inspiration as well. We mentioned the young lad there, Kenzie, being an inspiration, but certainly I'll bet Kenzie would be the first to say that Leighton going down there and giving him that kind of treatment is inspirational for them. Leighton's been smashing for us while he's been out injured, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> thankfully he's back on the football pitch. We had a behind closed doors friendly against Preston earlier this week. He played the 90 minutes, scored a goal and set one up. Brilliant news. Yeah, great news for us. It's been a difficult long road for Leighton. Uh, I'm sure he's been very, very frustrated, but he's back out doing what he's very, very good at, scoring goals and setting them up. How long would it take him to get back to match fitness? You would guess five or six games, all in all. Whether they become in the first team will just have to remain to be seen. But Brendan's done terrific and so has Brian as well. So we'll let him take his time. Absolutely. Well, let's leave the last word on this week's Everton show to the gaffer. Roberto Martinez, like the rest of us, will enjoy watching his players performing on the international stage this weekend. I'm sure he'll be wanting the Irish boys to emerge victorious from their playoff tie with Bosnia. But what about the Spain v England friendly in Alicante? Where on earth will Roberto's loyalties lie with that one? Well, no, I think... My affinity is with our players and, and clearly if we could get uh, a very good experience out of it, I think it would be very beneficial. Um, remember that for us, uh, internally, when the players go away on international duty, it's important that they get a good experience and they come back uh, ready to kick on and use the experience on international level as a good one. So from that point of view, I would, I would, uh, I would really enjoy seeing our players getting a, a good, uh, positive feeling out of that performance. A chance for Ross Bartley and John Stones to cement starting places for England in two high-profile friendlies. They are they are difficult games, of course, but I think it's a it's a difficult uh, it's a different type of of international game for them. I think John and Ross. Obviously, John has missed a few a few games, so it'll be great for him to get back into that environment. Ross, it was a, a, a an incredible contribution, the one that he had in the previous in the previous two games, and now is more. Uh, a case of experimenting, of trying different things. So, from a player point of view, it's just been very much open-minded, facing good opposition on on Spain and and, and and from and France at home. And from that point of view, it's just is a, a period of enjoyment. Uh, winning ten games on a trot is a, is exactly what everyone wanted. And uh, now they can they can afford just to enjoy the experience more than any other uh, country. Really, we've got Everton players. Uh, from the seniors right down to England under 19, you must be quite pleased with that. Well, it's always important. I think representing your country really helps you to find out a lot about yourself as a player. I think in the younger age groups, representing countries in, on the 18s level, on the 19s, on the 20s, on the 21s is, is very, uh, very educational and important for different reasons. As on the 21s, to see Tyus Browning and Brendan Galloway involved in the under 21s for England is really satisfying. Uh, Matty and, and Sam with the under 21s with the Republic of Ireland. We've got Mason Holgate and, and Russell, Russell Griffiths with the England under 20s. And, and, and throughout we got a lot, of, a lot of good experience out of those sort of games. So delighted that they can enjoy that as long as they, they come back healthy and, and ready to kick on with their own uh, situations at club level. Well, that was Roberto Martinez there, Graham.
Talk us through this one. I'll just tell the viewers what it's all about, by the way. We play Aston Villa a week on Saturday and we've themed it Retro Day. And that's when we have a look back at all things football from the 70s, 80s, 90s. And that. And that. <laughs> Early it's 90s. It's one my retro haircut that still hasn't changed to this day. <laughs> that's a couple of stone ago, isn't it? No, no, that's easy, easy. No. Does your football career go like that? It does, unfortunately. Um, I mean, you have got plenty of time. You know, there's no doubt about it. But, but when you get left out, you think the world's come to an end and you think you've only got a couple of years left and what have you. But, you know, you, you know these boys can extend their, um, their playing careers as well with the, with the sports science and mm. the way they look after themselves these days as well. So hopefully if you get yourself, uh, keep yourself injury free, you've got a good chance to play into your, you know, the back end of your 30s, early 40s even. It's a lot of fun retro day, isn't it? It is, it's a good chance day. To look so, back. Yeah, good chance to look back and uh, we'll celebrate it and hopefully the lads will go out and get a three points to, to make it a perfect day. That would be a perfect day. And you're still waiting, aren't you, for the other five Everton players to have scored in a World Cup finals. Stuart McCall, Kevin Sheedy, Gary Lineker, Yakubu, and Tim Cahill. There you go. And that's it for another Everton show. The best of luck to all of our lads on international duty this weekend. Just make sure you all come back safe and sound. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for your company. And we'll be back again next week. A very good night.